reading material outside edition. The book is Parapsychology. The author is Richard S. Broughton. Picking up where we left off, why does the controversy continue? For the last 10 years, we've been arguing about what constitutes science and scientific method and what societies use it. We even changed the bylaws about it. The PA uses statistics and blinds, placebos, double blinds, and other standard devices. The whole history of scientific advance is full of scientists investigating phenomena that the establishment did not believe was there. I submit we vote in favor of this association's work. There is nothing that one can't research the hell out of. Research, guided by bad judgment, is a black hole for good money. Now is the time for everyone who believes in the rule of reason to speak up against pathological science and its purveyors. Both of those quotations refer to the same organization, the Parapsychological Association. Both of them were delivered to our nation's premier scientific organization, the American Association for the Advancements, Advancement of Science, or AAAS. The, the first statement was made in December 1969 by the renowned anthropologist Margaret Mead, who spoke from the floor in support of the PA's application for affiliation with the AAAS. Following her statement, the membership voted 5 to 1 in favor of granting that affiliation. The second statement was made by noted physicist John A. Wheeler in an address to the AAAS in January 1979. It was the opening salvo in a campaign to drive the pseudos out of the workshop of science that he launched in hope of getting the PA disaffiliated from the AAAS. The campaign failed. And there's a notation here that connects with the bottom note here. It says, Wheeler's address drive the pseudos out of the workshop of science can be found in the New York Review of Books, April 13, 1979, when he originally delivered the address to the AAAS Wheeler injudiciously replied to a question with statements accusing Ryan of fraud in his pre-parapsychological research. The accusation was groundless, and Wheeler subsequently retracted it in a correction published in the AAS magazine Science, 13th of July, 1979, page 144. Nonetheless, AAAS legal counsel disallowed distribution of the cassette tapes of that part of the conference. Back to where we were. In or out of the halls of the scientific establishment, parapsychology has a way of stirring passions and provoking amazing reactions. Robert John was dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Princeton University and a noted authority on aerospace engineering with a long record of work for NASA and the Department of Defense when he decided that certain parapsychological problems were worth investigating. Did his colleagues applied his pi applaud his pioneering spirit? Not exactly. They as much said as he was crazy and a disgrace to science and the university. The university even convened an ad hoc committee to oversee his research, something unheard of for a scientist of his stature. Yet not all established scientists reacted that way, as John noted in a 1983 address to the PA. Speaking about the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Program, he said, we have had commentary on our program from no less than six Nobel laureates, two of whom categorically rejected the topic, two of whom encouraged us to push, encouraged us to push on, and two of whom were evasively equivocal. So much for the unanimity of high scientific opinion. Roots of the controversy. Robert John's experience is not an isolated one. In reference, the, the, the last name is John, J-A-H-N. I could say Jan, John, Jan. You get the idea. It's J-A-H-N, Robert J-A-H-N, if you want to look that up. Robert John's experience is not an isolated one. In fact, it is fairly typical of what distinguished scientists who dare to stray from orthodoxy have had to endure ever since the noted physicist William Crookes began examining the phenomena of spiritualism more than 100 years ago. There is a long history of scientific journals discriminating against parapsychological reports 
and an almost equally long history of principal government funding agencies that deny funding for parapsychological research. Although there is great public interest in the topic, the popular scientific press often prints vehement attacks on parapsychological research and on the researchers themselves. Parapsychology is controversial, no doubt about it, but why this is so turns out to be a fairly complicated issue. Fundamental to the controversy are the claims of parapsychology. Parapsychological hypothesis, uh, hypotheses at the very least claim that humans can acquire information or affect external physical systems in ways that science in its present state cannot explain. If these claims are correct, then the existing worldview that science gives us will have to be modified. The so-called laws of physics will have to be rewritten. Of itself, this should not be controversial, since the scientific worldview is always undergoing modification and the laws of physics have been rewritten several times in just the last century. This is called scientific progress. Yet some scientists are profoundly uncomfortable with this possibility and feel that the domain of human communication and action is already completely understood, so any apparent need for modification is spurious. Just how controversial parapsychology is depends on whom you ask. The public does not think of parapsychology as a particularly controversial science, since surveys frequently show that most people either accept the reality of ESP or have had psychic experiences themselves. Oddly enough, even a very large percentage of scientists and academics see nothing wrong with parapsychology, or at least parapsychology's main topic of study. Over the decades, several surveys have been made of scientists' opinions on ESP. The percentage of scientists who think that ESP is an established fact, or that ESP is a likely possibility, has climbed from a low of 8% in a survey of 352 members of the American Psychological Association in 1938, just as the Duke University work was becoming known, to highs of 67% and 75% in two large, well over 1,000 respondents each, surveys conducted in the early 70s. With such evidence indicating that so many scientists are willing to consider ESP a likely possibility, you may wonder why parapsychology courses are not routinely found in colleges and universities and why there are so few labs doing research in this area. A more recent survey conducted by University of Maryland sociologist Dr. James McLennan, M-C-C-L-E-N-O-N, -E in 1981 may suggest some reasons. McLennan surveyed the administrative elite, the council, and selected section committees of the AAAS. These scientists were more skeptical of ESP, with just under 30% believing that ESP was an established fact or a likely possibility. Those in the social sciences, where parapsychology courses would normally be categorized, were even more skeptical. 20% were believers. Than those in the natural sciences, where 30% were believers. Clearly the percentage of scientists willing to entertain the possibility of ESP, and presumably the study of it, is much lower among those who run the scientific establish establishments than among average working scientists. Science is not just the steady accumulation of little facts, one building upon the other. It is a steady accumulation of little facts punctuated periodically by major upheavals in the whole scientific view. Minor revolutions in science, such as the acceptance of continental drift, happen all the time. Major revolutions, such as Einstein's theory of relativity, happen less frequently. Change from minor revisions to major revolution is the very essence of scientific progress, and change never comes easily. From the discovery of anomalies, pieces that do not fit into the pre prevailing scientific picture, to the general acceptance of a revised picture that makes sense of the anomalies, is often a long and difficult road. The prevailing scientific view will not give in easily to a challenger, and the battle is waged not only with data and reasoned debate, but also with ridicule and scorn, censorship and denial, and just about every other rhetorical and political tactic. Parapsychology may or may not contain the seeds for a major upheaval in science. Only time will tell. Many a scientific anomaly has come and gone without provoking a scientific revolution. What is clear is that the controversy surrounding parapsychology bears the hallmarks of at least a potential revolution. 
Sociologists of science see this both in the activities and strategies of those who believe the claims of parapsychology should be rejected and in the parapsychologists' effort to win the approval of orthodox science. Frustrating as this struggle may be to those who champion the unpopular cause, we must accept that this is part of the give and take of normal science, the winnowing of the wheat from the chaff of human knowledge. The pivotal point about which the entire parapsychological controversy turns is whether or not normal explanations, which are compatible with the existing worldview, have really been excluded for any given parapsychological claim or experimental result. Could the subject in Researcher X's experiment in fact have obtained the information through some normal means? Did Subject Y have an opportunity to cheat in such and such an experiment? This is where scientific control becomes so important. But there is another equally important but often unacknowledged factor, a person's priori concept of just how improbable the phenomena are. If a person's a priori conviction is that psi phenomena cannot possibly exist, then any normal explanation, no matter how bizarre and convoluted it may have to be, will be preferable to an explanation that invokes psi phenomena. By a priori, uh, it means their, their previous conviction, you know, how they expect the experiment to go. Are psi phenomena really impossible according to contemporary science? As Robert John's experience as the Nobel laureates revealed, the answer will depend upon whom you ask. Certainly there has been a tradition, both in philosophy and in science, that would make psi phenomena impossible. That This is the tradition or philosophy of materialism which holds that all phenomena, whether they are chemical reactions or mental events, such as memories, can ultimately be reduced to discrete, analyzed bits of matter and observable interactions between such particles. For this perspective, the idea that information can be transferred from one person to another, or from some object to a person without material, a material transmission medium, or that action can take, take place at a distance without material connecting the cause and the effect is purely and simply impossible. Fortunately, the march of scientific progress is usually only temporarily slowed down by people saying impossible. For a long time, meteorites were declared impossible. The idea that continents could drift around the surface of the Earth was ridiculed for decades. The history of science is full of other impossibilities that have become ordinary parts of everyday life. A number of leading physicists acknowledged giants of the field, such as Henry Margano, M-A-R-G-E-N-A-U, I know I'm mispronouncing that, David Bohm and O. Costa de Beauregard have reportedly claimed, repeatedly claimed, that there is nothing in quantum physics that forbids psi phenomena. De Beauregard maintains that certain axioms of quantum physics virtually demand that psi phenomena exist. Nobel laureate Brian Josephson, a strong supporter of parapsychology, has stated that some of the most convincing evidence he has seen for the existence of psi phenomena comes not from the diligent work of the parapsychologists, but from experiments in quantum physics. So, science does not speak with one voice on the matter of parapsychology. Such is life on the frontiers of knowledge. All we can say now is that the jury is still out. Just a second, let me check how much battery life I still have. Okay, we're good. From a scientific point of view, what we are calling psi phenomena can be explained in one of two ways. Either they can be attributed to such constructs as ESP, PK, and so forth, explanations that the paranormal are for the present, but will become normal if they are brought within general scientific worldview, or they can be attributed to ordinary normal factors, unrecognized by the investigators, but perfectly explicable by today's science. Sandpiper. Parapsychologists obvious, obviously are betting on the first explanation, Sec skeptics on the second. Actually, skeptic is not the best word to describe those who reject the possibility of psi phenomena. A true skeptic is inclined to question easy answers from whatever point of view. I prefer to use an expression advocated by my colleague John Palmer, who recommends that people preferring the second type of explanation can be called conventional theorists. That is, those who try to explain apparent psi phenomena in terms of conventional scientific knowledge. Conventional explanations of psi phenomena are as varied as the imagination can devise, but they basically fall into two classes, incompetence and fraud. 
The conventional theorist will maintain that if one carefully examines any given parapsycho parapsychological experiment, one will find methodological flaws and lapses in controls that could permit the subject or subjects to accomplish the task through perfectly normal means. The subject may be as unaware as the experimenter that he is using ordinary sensory information. Furthermore, this claim can be can apply easily, as easily, to spontaneous case investigations as it does to laboratory experimentation. And even if there is no obvious evidence of incompetence in the investigation, there is always the possibility of fraud. The objections of conventional theorists are not without merit. Certainly, there have been parapsycho parapsychological experiments that, after being reported and generally accepted, are later found to have weaknesses. For example, in one type of experiment, subjects were asked to judge which art print out of a set of five was being viewed by an agent elsewhere. The agent would have spent some time trying to communicate one of those pictures, usually by holding it and looking at it. In a few early experiments, the experimenters had only one set of pictures, so the same set that the agent used was later used by the subject. Might not the subject have noticed that one picture had been handled recently? Whether or not the subject actually did make use of handling cues is not known, but the fact that they could have undermines our confidence that all sensory information had been excluded. Errors in statistical analysis of experimental results may lead an experimenter to conclude that chance had been eliminated as an explanation when in fact it had not. Not surprisingly, most slip-ups in experimental methodology or statistics are caught by fellow parapsychologists. They, more than anyone else, feel the obligation to keep their experiments as near to perfect as possible. Fraud, too, is a problem from time to time. In the days of psychical research, quite a few mediums were found to be faking psychic effects, and even in the laboratory, a few subjects have been caught cheating. Even worse, on one occasion, a parapsychologist was caught cheating by his colleagues, and in at least two other cases, there is strong circumstantial evidence that the experimenter faked parapsychological data. Worth noting is that in all of these cases, it was other parapsychologists who brought the evidence forward. While fraud by experimenters is utterly reprehensible, it is reassuring to me that parapsychologists are doing a pretty good job, at least, of policing themselves. Recent media coverage of fraud in science suggests that parapsychologists are well ahead of their colleagues in other branches of science in rooting out fraud. Hundreds and hundreds of experiments in parapsychology have provided good evidence of psi phenomena. Are they all fatally flawed or the result of fraud? That is quite a sweeping indictment, but some critics would answer, probably so. Their reasoning is that even in experiments where they cannot point to specific flaws, they are quite sure they are there. It just might take a sharper eye to find them. Accusations of fraud are even more sinister than accusations of flawed methodology. Critics frequently see no problem in alleging fraud without even a shred of evidence. One famous example of this took place in 1955 when Dr. G. R. Price, then a research associate in the Department of Medicine at the University of Minnesota, published an article in the prestigious journal Science. Price argued that ESP was scientifically impossible and that therefore J.B. Ryan and the British investigator S.G. Soul, S-O-A-L, must be fraudulent experimenters. Appearing as it did in such an authoritative journal, this article was taken by many otherwise uncommitted scientists as the final dismissal of ESP research. It was not until 1972 that Price admitted he was mistaken and withdrew some of his accusations. Later, he further admitted that he had written the original, original article in Science without even a slight attempt to find evidence of fraud and in fact had been under the mistaken assumption that Ryan was trying to promote some sort of religious belief. I can see the amount of battery time we have left isn't going to let us finish the next section. The next section is named, named The Rise of Fundamentalism. That'll be next time. Again, the reading material is Parapsychology by Richard S. Broughton. There are links below to get your own copy if you want. The book has been out of print for a very considerable amount of time. It's a very awesome book. I recommend it for anybody that 
discusses parapsychology and paranormal phenomena on a regular basis. I feel like it's a very important tool if you're going to discuss parano paranormal phenomena, parapsychology, especially extrasensory perception and psychokinesis. I feel like it's a must-have resource.